good morning. I can't fit. There's a little trap door in this stage, but I wanted to come out of that for this intro. Um, it didn't work, so here we are. Uh, welcome. Uh, like Ashley said, I'm Matt. If uh, you don't remember me from earlier, uh, I'm the worship and creative arts pastor here <laughs> at the Well Church, and so... Uh, <clears throat> We're all in some form pulling double duty a little bit today, and so uh, we're, we're glad that you're here. If you're new here, uh, we're in the middle of a series right now called Vision, where we're talking about the four primary focuses of our church in this year, and honestly, I, I don't see it changing very much in the future because these are, are four of the, the core tenets of the early church in the Gospels, and so if you, you missed uh, week one, we talked about discipleship and what it means to be learners um, that, that are studying and, and growing together in the knowledge and in the walk with Jesus, and so uh, Pastor Ashley taught, and she, she gave some uh, really great information on, on like boiling down discipleship. What does it look like for us to, to be with Jesus, to learn from Jesus, how to be like Jesus, and, and some real practical ways that we do that as both individuals and as a community. And so she, she gave things like examples through our, our small groups and how, how we take our community with us through things like classes. Many, many of you got to maybe attend uh, Katie's class on, on, uh, called Commissioned last week where we talked about how, how we share the gospel in our everyday life. And then uh, as well as, as resources, right now we're working as a staff to, to be able to provide you with the same resources that we study and, and how we are, are learning and growing in our walk with Jesus. There are a lot of churches that, that kind of play things close to their chest and they keep you know, their, their resources, the, way, the things that they're studying for their sermons, uh, kind of behind closed doors. And, and we think that you know, whether it's somebody that we uh, fully agree with and align with or not, that, that if it's helpful for us on our walk with Jesus, that we, we want to provide it for you. We want you to be able to have the same access to be able to track with us in, in our thought processes and, and how we grow and learn to follow Jesus. We don't want to keep that to ourselves. And so we're, we're working on various ways to do that and engage with the gospel uh, in really practical tools that we can give everyone. And so uh, week two, if you, if you missed it, uh, was Rob talking about generosity. That was last week. If you weren't here last week, you might be like, yes, like dodge that bullet. Nobody ever wants to be here for the, like, the generosity, the finance sermon. And that's fair. Like we get it. We just like we just talked about. Like there is there is a, a, a lot that is a lot of baggage that people carry around that topic. And if you did miss it, I, I would highly suggest that you go back and you watch Rob because Rob did such a, a beautiful job of breaking down some of the misrepresentation of scripture and some of the coercion and, and pressure that has come with it throughout the years and, and how really what it means to be generous is is an overflow of God's work in our life that we have the opportunity to join in with our time, with our, our finances, with our resources, with, with our actions and our words, we get to join in the work of the kingdom with joy and with freedom. It was never about coercion. There was nobody, there's nobody up in heaven who's like keeping tally on the exact percentage that you're giving. It's, it's about how we engage in the work of the gospel, that we're committed to, to building this together with our, our resources and with our time and with our energy, that, that this is something that we believe matters to us. And so that's why there's so much emphasis on, on the cheerful spirit and the heart behind what it is that, that we are generous with. And so uh, he talked a lot about that. I, I would really highly suggest that you go back and watch it because it is very liberating if you struggle with, if you've got some baggage around that area. It's a really helpful thing. And so today... Uh, I, I get the pleasure of talking about hospitality, which is a, a fairly big concept uh, in the church and, and why it's very important to us as a church. So we'll look at it in, in two kind of primary ways. What, is, what does it mean for us as individuals to be hospitable? How do we interact with people in our daily life in a way that's, that's hospitable? And then how do we do this as a community, as a collective, as a group of people? Um, because so often we think of this as like, well, that's the staff's responsibility, but the reality is, is that we are the church all together. It's not just like the staff is the church and then you guys just attend, but the, there is a concept called the priesthood of all believers that if you follow Jesus, it is your responsibility as well to make this place a hospitable place for people. And so the definition of the word hospitality is the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. So we look first at, at Jesus' ministry. Where, where does he go? Like where does he spend his time? Who does he spend his time with what does he do most of the time? Jesus spent the majority of his, his ministry on earth bringing people into the kingdom one meal at a time. He spent his, his life inviting those who were cast out, the others, 
opening up a seat at the table. There is a seat at Jesus' table for you. The theologian Robert Karras said that in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. That is how he spent the majority of that gospel. So hospitality is how Jesus lived. So as followers of Jesus, this is how we are supposed to live. If he got to do it, so do we. And so uh, a quick story. My, my wife and I, uh, I'm super excited about this. On, on Thursday, we'll be celebrating 10 years of marriage. Uh, yeah, yes, please cheer for that. I'm like, I'm so out of my depth. It's unbelievable. And every day is like a celebration for me that she is still here. So, uh, you know, I appreciate that. But so, you know, if you could do the math, we got married in 2014. And shortly after we got married, uh, we moved across the United States. I took a job at a church in, in Pennsylvania. And for us, this was... We were so excited, like, we're finally adults, like, this is a, a big adventure, it's, we're, we're doing this, we're going out on our own together, building something new for ourselves. It was before we knew that being an adult is trash, okay, that, like, <laughs> don't do it if you can help it, all right? So, you know, like, we were very naive, and we were really excited, um, but anyway, so we moved to Pennsylvania in October, and Thanksgiving was going to be the first time that we had spent a holiday away from our families. We both come from, from big families, and, and those are times that we spend surrounded by people that we love. And so this was a, a new concept for us. You know, we, we're here in, in Oklahoma City. We, we uh, live right outside of Tinker Air Force Base, so we were no strangers to having people that we didn't really know at our table around Thanksgiving. To, to invite people that, that didn't have family. There's transplants there. People who, for all intents and purposes, were strangers to us, were invited to a seat at our table. This was something that was familiar. It was normal to us. And so we were a bit anxious of what does this look like for us being that? We are the new people now. We, we don't have family here. And so, you know, here we are 1,300 miles away from home, nearing this big family holiday with no family. And uh, one Sunday, I was hanging out in the lobby, and, and some people came up, and they were talking to us, and they said, hey, what, like, what are you guys' plans for Thanksgiving? And I was like, well, actually, we don't know. Like, we're just kind of realizing, like, in the hustle and bustle of moving, that, like, what are we going to do? We don't have family here. We're, we're not actually sure what our plans are. And they, they were like, wow, wow, that's terrible. Listen, let me tell you, our family, when we get together for Thanksgiving, like, Thanksgiving is our holiday. Like, it's not, not Christmas, not Easter, not Halloween. Like, Thanksgiving is the big shebang. Like, we have a huge party, barbecue. Everyone brings incredible food. There's, you know, wineries and breweries, and, and we, we all come together and share around the table. People bring, everybody brings yard games or board games, and like, I mean, it's just such an incredible time. And I'm like, I'm listening. I'm going like, listen, yes, I'm in. What, you just tell me when was the time I'm invested. Like, I, I'm ready. I'll move in with you guys. I don't, this sounds incredible. And so they're just kind of hyping this up, and I, I'm so, I'm super excited, you know, to get to this. And they get to the end of, of kind of hyping this up, and I'm sitting here, I'm expecting, I'm like, just tell me when. Like, are we going now? I'll go to the store right now, get whatever we need, and we can start today if you would like. This sounds like fun. Honestly, if I had the choice between this and family, I don't know, this Sounds like a cool option, and I maybe want to experience what that's like. And so, so we get to the end of this, and he's hyping this up, and he looks me dead in the eyes, and he goes, well, I hope you have a good Thanksgiving, and walked away. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That's exactly how I was like, what just happened? Like, I looked at Faith, and I was like, were, am I wrong? Were you expecting an invite at the end of this conversation and she was like, no, absolutely. That was very weird. I was like, I was dumbfounded. I was devastated. Like, I have intense FOMO, and this is probably the meanest thing that you could ever do to me, is to describe how cool this party is going to be that I'm not allowed to come to. And so, uh, so I sat there, and I was like, why would, why would you do that? Like, what kind of person? And I've realized in years since, because it really is, like, to this day, one of the wildest interactions I've ever had. I was like, what was, did this guy hate me? And he just was, like, doing this on purpose? I don't know. But I realized that hospitality is so important because I actually have seen the church in one way or another do this very thing where we talk so extensively about the beauty and, and the grace and this expansive kingdom of God just to tell people that they're not allowed in, to close the door in their face, and that is never the way that Jesus operated his kingdom. He was entrenched in hospitality. It was the way that, that he operated. So, like, you know, I'm ready for the invite. And they essentially tell this whole story about their family. 
what I thought was to sell me the invite to go like, you guys are the new pastors, would love to have you. But instead they were like, look at these losers and there are no Thanksgiving plans. And that hurt. <laughs> like it kind of scarred me. I was like, hey, I don't care for this at all. I don't want to be a part of this. And, and to, you know, like that was like, it was a, a poor kickoff. And, and things, you know, in some ways got better to, to share maybe the opposite side of that. The next year we experienced quite the opposite where we had shared Christmas dinner with a, a person, that, a friend of mine that I'd worked with. His name was Tom, his wife, Gina, and then her parents, Janet and Lamar, who uh, Faith and I began to affectionately refer to as our adopted grandparents. Like they were some of the kindest people we'd ever met. And they said, hey, we would love to have you over for Christmas. And so they had us over for dinner and they also had invited a Malaysian exchange student. Gina had, had, was working at the college there at the time, and so she had brought a Malaysian exchange student home. And, and for Faith and I, it's like, we don't have any family in the state. He doesn't have any family in the hemisphere. Like, so, you know, it was like, we kind of understand, but not even close. And so he was so excited to be in, invited over to dinner that he had asked if he could cook for us. And so he made a traditional Malaysian curry, and he, he walked us through how their family would eat this meal and what it meant for them to sit around the table. And it was, to this day, one of the most meaningful experiences I've ever had. I got to experience the richness and, and the diversity of the kingdom of God through hospitality. And I got to see the way that it impacted others. I learned more about my world. I came away from that experience a, a better Christ follower. So the way that we greet others, the way that we invite others, the way that we share our lives with others is central to how we follow Jesus. It's always been important, but in 2024, we actually now have um, some, some statistics that we can like actually ground ourselves in on why hospitality is so important. We are living in a, a season that a lot of psychologists refer to as the loneliness epidemic, that uh, according to the Survey Center on American Life, the percentage of Americans who say they have no close friends at all has quadrupled since 1990. 54% of Americans report often, if not always, feeling that no one really knows them. Around 40% of Americans have claimed that they have zero close friends or confidants. And we're seeing a dramatic increase in mental health crises and Pastor Ashley talked about it a while back, that, that mental health is the next big frontier for ministry. How do we engage? How, how, how do we talk about it? How do we minister to people? And she's spot on. Suicide rates in the United States have increased by 33% over the last two decades. The rate of major depression in, in students and youth has increased by 63% just over the last couple of years. What is our responsibility in this as both individuals? What is our responsibility as a church? How do we deal with this? How do we function in this world? And my thought is, is that what if our Sunday service was different? What if instead of it being a sales pitch for Jesus, where we focus on converting people, what if we just focused on caring for people? What if we focus on, on what, are, what are things, tangible things that we can actually do to live and operate in the world that brings light and goodness where there is anxiety and, and tragedy and darkness? For the gospel to truly matter, it has to change the way that we live and interact with our world. Jesus didn't invite people to his table so that he could pitch them a, a timeshare in heaven. It wasn't like, yeah, the, you know, like he's just trying to bump up the numbers a bit. Jesus targeted the outcast, the other, the people who were downtrodden, the people who were cast out by society, by the religious authority, those who were labeled worthless, who were sinners, who were heathens. Jesus targeted them because he knew whose image they reflected. And he knew the beauty that these diverse groups of people could bring to the kingdom of God. He knew the power of hospitality to heal the hurting. So in Luke 19, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him 
and since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. You know, I grew up in the church. How many of you are familiar that there's like a song that is pretty popular with this story? You can show hands. You can, it's all right. You don't have to be embarrassed. We've all sang it at some point or another. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. I, it, I, I'll admit I was a lot older when I realized that his size didn't actually really have much to do with the story. We emphasized it quite a bit. And I, like, I remember as a kid thinking like, wow, like Jesus can even forgive short people. Like he's crazy. Like, you know, like I don't, I was like, I don't know what this means, but it seems like this really matters. And it turns out it didn't matter. What, what the focus was is, is his position was his job as a tax collector. You see the, the Roman empire, they didn't, they didn't hire like soldiers to, to collect taxes. They didn't hire like outside auditors. What they did was they hired fellow Jews. And so these Jewish tax collectors were considered traitors to their people. There weren't really any laws governing uh, or guardrails of how much they could take. So they would take and give what was owed to Caesar and then take as much as they wanted after that. So they were essentially robbing their own people. They were not looked upon very highly. And yet, here comes Jesus. And in fact, he, this isn't really, it's like a reverse hospitality is what he does. He doesn't invite Zacchaeus to a seat at his table. He goes, I'm coming to your house today. Like, you're going to be hospitable to me. I'm going to come sit at your table. And then going to Zacchaeus' house and, and breaking bread with Zacchaeus and sitting at his table, Jesus shifts the whole paradigm. That that God is not a God who would just welcome you with open arms, but God is a God who will go to where you are. That he will meet you where you're at, the sinner, the hated, the ostracized, the loathed. He will come to you. John Mark Comer said, the inclusion of sinners in the community of salvation achieved in table fellowship is the most meaningful expression of the message of the redeeming love of God. There's a theologian who once said that Jesus got himself killed because of the way that he ate. He ate with all of the wrong people. To Jesus, he was breaking bread. To the religious authority, he was breaking rules. You don't collude with these people. You don't go out and about with sinners with sex workers, with tax collectors. You don't do that. And because it's an election year, I think it's important that, that we notice Jesus sometimes all of a sudden becomes very important to politicians when their seat of power is up for debate. And so you're going to see a lot of politicians begin to, to talk about Jesus and how important Jesus is. To them, but I want you to pay attention. Who who are they breaking bread with? Who are are the people that are around them, and how are their lives playing out? See, just because Jesus hung out with sinners and with prostitutes, he changed the trajectory of their lives. Just because our politicians are hanging out with the same groups doesn't mean that they're doing it for the same purpose. And so don't be fooled. Don't let them use your, your faith to rile you up into doing exactly what the Pharisees and those in the religious authority at the time were doing, othering people, saying these people are off limits. These people are unwelcome here. Jesus went to those specifically and told them, there is a seat at my table for you. He ate with all of the wrong people. He wasn't interested in the exclusive club that the Pharisees had because up until this point, the understanding of the Jewish people was that God is, is only, he's the God of Israel. 
He is the God of, of the Jewish people, and, and Jesus changed all of that with hospitality because he opened up a seat at his table for the Gentile. He welcomed the stranger with open arms. In the first century, to share a meal with somebody was a sacred act. To invite somebody into your home, to sit at your table, was to invite them into your intimate space. In many traditions, that a seat at the table sharing a meal together was the beginning of peace among warring tribes. To betray somebody with whom you had broken bread with was considered the ultimate betrayal. The table mattered. And Jesus carried that weight and he wielded that invitation well. I want us to, to notice two things. At the end of that story with Zacchaeus in verse 9, Jesus says, salvation has come to this house today. In that moment, Jesus is, is saying that the, the man who had once strayed far from God, who had taken advantage of and, and hurt God's own people, had been welcomed back to the table. That he was no longer an outsider, but he was a part of a community. And he was a part of a community that changed everything that he had known. He was a part of a community that gave its resources to those in need as opposed to taking what he could for himself. In this one invitation, Jesus upended his whole world and shifted everything that he had done for his whole life to be something that brings about beauty and life, generosity. He had taken the most selfish and self-serving actions and reversed them. This is the upside down kingdom that Jesus cared about. And this is the power of hospitality, of, of embracing those who have been cast out. And the second thing I want to notice is he said uh, in verse 10, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And this mirror is actually something that he said a couple chapters earlier in Luke 7. And he's talking about this same topic. He says, for John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you said, he has a demon. And then the son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. He's saying, time will tell. We'll see where the chips fall. And, and then he followed that by a story of hospitality where the, the Pharisees had invited Jesus to dine at their table. And this is, uh, I won't dive into the whole story because actually Rob uh, preached on this in our parable series, this, this story, um, and so I'll, I'll summarize it. This, the, his message was called Perfume Poured Out. I would highly suggest that you go because he, he, he takes a much deeper dive into the story, but there's something at the end of this story that is really paramount to, to what we talk about with hospitality and how, how, Jesus, uh, how much Jesus cared about it. And so as a, a quick summary, Jesus was invited by the Pharisees to, to come and, and have dinner with him. And as he sits at the table, a sinful woman, which is this is the way that scripture often refers to uh, sex workers or, or, or people whose sin is sexual in nature, the sinful woman. Uh, she comes and she washes Jesus' feet with her tears, dries it with her hair. She pours perfume out on him and her desperation to be in the presence of Jesus is evident. And one of the Pharisees in this moment makes a comment. He says, this guy can't be, he's not a prophet. If he was a prophet, he, he would know who this woman is. He would know what she's done. And Jesus responds to him and he tells the story of debt and forgiveness uh, that you, you may be familiar with. But this is how, how he ends that after he asks the Pharisee, you know, who, who do you think was more grateful? And he said, well, the one who's had the bigger debt. And he, he turned towards the woman and he said to Simon, so I want you like picture this for a moment in your mind. Jesus turns towards this woman who all of these people around this table are looking at with disdain and disgust. And he turns towards this woman and he's looking at her in the eyes and he's talking to the Pharisees. And he says, do you see this woman? I came into your house 
and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time that I have entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured out perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. What I'd like to draw your attention to here is that Jesus isn't reprimanding the Pharisees for bad theology. He's not upset about the doctrine that they hold. He's angry at their lack of hospitality. The way that that we welcome people into our lives, the way that we treat them, feed them, and care for them is directly tied to the overflow of the goodness of God's work in our lives. Just like Paul said that that faith without works is dead, Jesus is saying something similar here. He's saying that the way that you treat others shows that you don't even understand the goodness and the grace and the love of God. It shows in your actions. It shows in your lack of hospitality. And so we, church, have to be a people who refuse to fall into the trap of othering when we live our our lives skeptical of those who are different from us, when we're ready to to lob verbal bombs and, and to distance ourselves from people that we don't understand, we rob ourselves of the richness and the beauty and the diversity that is in the kingdom of Jesus. It requires significant work of us to get outside of our comfort zone, to be warm, to practice hospitality to be eyes up, and to be frank, we we live in a different age. Community doesn't look the same as it did in the first century. People are spread out. We have technology. There are all kinds of things. So so what it means and what it requires of us is, is a little different. We actually have a bit of a harder job to be hospitable. There are more barriers. But Jesus shows us that This richness, this diversity that is in the kingdom is exactly what comes from following him. Look at like look at the people he surrounded himself. Look at like this ragtag group of disciples from crazy, varying backgrounds. Look at Paul and his conversion. Like the Christian walk in the church is not a, a homogenous mass of clones. It's rich. Background, ethnicity, sound, look, feel, all of these things working in tandem to reveal the nature of the kingdom of God, to bring about life, life, and more life. So what does it it mean for us? It means that we have to have our eyes up, that we can't live in silos. It means that as we walk around the store throughout our day, that as we interact with people, are you paying attention? Are you curious about what other people are going through? Are you quick to offense? Are you skeptical of everybody around you's actions? Are you constantly ready to give yourself the benefit of the doubt, but hold everyone else accountable in your life. It requires us to think deeply about the way that we operate, the way that we speak about people when they're not around, the way that we speak to people when they are around. It's not easy, and especially in a world that seems bent on whipping us up into a frenzy to us and them conversations, to to separate ourselves from people that we disagree with, to demonize people who are on the other side, whichever side that is. That is what the world wants because that's what sells. That's what increases profits. But the kingdom of God is not interested in any of that. The kingdom of God is not interested in survival of the fittest. Jesus said it himself, in your weakness you are strong. When we rely on God, but not not ourselves, when we rely on God, that is where our strength comes from. That's opposite of what the world will tell you. That doesn't make any sense. Most of what Jesus does doesn't make any sense to the world. And that's why you see beauty and life 
spring up from wastelands. Our church is strange. It's weird. I think that's fine. I think we can all admit it a little bit. Like, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> it is. We're a weird group of people, and we have a unique opportunity to show the world what it looks like for differences to be represented, for people to disagree, and to still be in community and to love, to share in the good work, to bring light, to use our, our resources in, in a world that says, all of this is mine and I need to keep what's mine. We have a unique opportunity to share the good news. The gospel is good news to the whole world. And we have the unique opportunity to share that good news through our work, through the way that we speak, through the way that we live, to testify that God is doing something different, to bring hope. What does that mean for us as a, as a church? You know, too, too often I think we, we expect that like, well, that's the staff job. Like, they'll figure it out, you know. We might come in and serve, but the reality is, is, is Scripture describes something that's called the, the priesthood of all believers. If you follow Jesus, you bear some of that burden that the church is not just a staff and then a group of people who attend. We are the church collectively. Each of us are a part of a whole so what is our responsibility? How, how are we hospitable to people? If you're a part of our First Impressions team, uh, they did a training a couple weeks ago, and so I pulled some statistics from uh, the training that they had done because it was really well thought out and eyes up about what it means for us to be a church that's welcoming to other people. And so some of those statistics I want to give to you right now. First-time guests will decide if they will return to a church within the first six to 10 minutes that they're there. That's before, like, that's before I step on stage, that's before the music starts, that's before the, the sermon happens. People have made up their mind. So what does, that, what does that mean? That means when they walk through those doors, they're paying attention. They, they notice who's looking at them. They notice how people are looking at them do People look at me like I don't belong here. Do the people who are serving, are, are they happy to see me? Is it a burden that I'm walking in here to this place? Do I, do I feel dumb because I don't know where to go? Are, are there clear signs that, that tell me what I, I should be doing? Is the check-in process for my kids, do I feel like my kids are safe? All of these things work in tandem to, to make people go, I, I don't know that I'll come back. And that's before anything else starts. That is not just a responsibility of the staff. It means that when you're in the lobby, how are you interacting with people? How are you engaging with people? How are you welcoming in the stranger? According to Gallup, 20% of Americans attend church every week. Congrats on being the 20% this week. 41% um, of Americans attend church at least once a month. 57% of Americans are seldom or never in religious services at all. And on average, the American congregation is at about 85% of its pre-pandemic capacity. We've seen things like the exvangelical movement and people walking away from the faith and, and a lot of people leaving really harmful spaces and there are parts of that that are really good where I think that, that we can kind of tear things back to the foundation and figure out what really matters in this life, what really matters to, to following Jesus, to how we talk about things, how we invest our time and, and our energy. But I, I saw a video recently on TikTok that um, I, I see, you know, like, I'm sure you guys are no strangers to, like, church controversy, that there are leadership failures, stories of abuse, like, almost weekly at this point, the way that the church has failed, and it can be pretty demoralizing sometimes, and so I saw a video, and this woman was saying, you know, like, I, I served as a, you know, on the worship team at my church, and I, let me tell you about the way that the church is manipulating you, and I, I don't want to to belittle whatever hurt it was that she went through, but she went on to describe basic planning 
as manipulation tactics. She said that when people are smiling at the doors, do you know that they're trained to do that? I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you, if you do not like people, please don't join the First Impressions team. If you're like, dude, I hate seeing new people, that's not the space that we want to put you. And I think that that's just good stewardship <laughs> is to say like, yeah, hey, make people feel well. Like, and, and I was really surprised because I'm, I'm used to, to occupying, I'm always occupying spaces where I see people expressing their hurt with the church and the way that the church has failed. And I'm always interested to learn from those people because I've experienced a lot of those same things and we've come to maybe different conclusions, but how can I be eyes up and aware of the way that people are hurting? And I was really surprised to see the comments flooded with people who are saying, everything that you just described is good. It's good to, to be welcoming, to plan for people, to, to make sure that you're prepared for the people that walk through your doors. I don't understand what's negative about this. And, I, and I, my heart breaks for the amount of hurt that she had, had experienced that would shape her view in this way. Because there is no doubt, there are churches that, that do manipulate people. But if you're new here, I would like to tell you, I'll put it out, all out at front. There's no secrets. We prepared for you. We planned it. We prayed for you before you came in. Our goal is because we truly do believe in the power of Jesus to change your life for the better, to change the world around you for the better. We are desperate to remove any barrier that we can that would keep you from knowing the life that is in Jesus. That's our whole goal. It's not that like you would come here and you would hear some like cool, kitschy, quotable line and you could leave and promote it on social media. Like we just want you to leave with the resources necessary for you to know Jesus, to get closer, to, to change the world around you because that is what Jesus does. Through hospitality, Jesus heals people. We believe that a life modeled after Jesus is the best life that you could possibly live. It brings hope to the world. So let me just kind of outline a couple things that we do with intentionality because we, we are intentional about the way that we do things and the way that, that it may be received by people. We're aware of our, our place and we're aware of the hurt that, that comes through these doors. So here are a couple small things that, that matter to us in the way that we think about what happens in this room on a Sunday. We could provide Folgers, you know, like it's something, but instead we decided to invest a little bit more money to support a local coffee shop. To, to invest in our, our community because we believe it matters. And also to be frank, the coffee's better. And so when you come in on Sunday, uh, we hope that, that that cup brings something to you. It gives you a little bit of, of life, a, a little bit of get up. And we hope that, that you enjoy our partners at Culture Coffee and Sincerely Coffee Roasters here in Oklahoma City. I... I kind of pushed for that. I've pushed for it at every church I've been. Like, why are we not, we don't need to invest in, in Starbucks. And I, I say that as somebody who gets Starbucks regularly, that I, I wanna be a church that supports the work of, of local businesses, that, that supports our community. You may not know this, um, but we don't buy donuts. Like our, our church doesn't buy donuts to set out on Sunday mornings. There are people here who, like the, the table has been central to this church. It was one of the reasons why I felt so at home when I first came here because these people really cared about one another and they shared meals together and that was important to them. And so there are people who come to this church who bring donuts every Sunday because they want people to feel at home. They're not, they don't ask for reimbursement for that. And then there are other people who saw that and notice that we didn't have an option for people with food allergies. And so they started either home making it themselves or buying it themselves to bring here so that there are options available for people so that people, when they come through those doors, they feel welcomed, they feel thought of. We do our best to make the check-in process for your kids as, as painless as possible. 
that you know that you have time to ask questions, that, that, that when you walk away, you feel good, that you know your child is, is safe and they're not just safe, but they're actually enjoyed and that they're loved. Because where else can you take your kid where they don't have to perform, they don't have to achieve anything, they don't have to bring anything to the table to be invested in, to be poured into, where else? We push things like small groups because that's how we take the church with us when we go. We want you to be plugged into a community of, of people who can be your support network, who can stand in the gap for you when you need it, who you can call when you're at your lowest, who will be there. All this to say that there is a lot of intention that goes into a Sunday morning. But by no means do we view Sunday morning as, as the, the highlight of the week or the, or the end goal, but instead it's the, the fuel station that, that propels us through our week. How we have tools to, to navigate the day-to-day -day from our office to our home, to the grocery store. How, how are we growing together? There's a lot of intention that goes into that, into being hospitable. And I wanna say that you don't have to serve on a team for that to be the case. That you don't, you don't have to volunteer here to be a part of that. I would actually say because of that statistic, when it comes to, to people coming to church, what's actually most important is the people that aren't serving. What are they like? The people that are just attending, do they care that I'm here? Are they upset? Am I sitting in their seat? Do they want me here? You have a responsibility. Uh, Sherry Stickley, who, if you weren't here, we shared her story. She serves on the First Impressions team, and I got to sit down and, and talk with her and, and get a bit of her story. Why, why does she serve? Why is this important to her? And let me tell you, it was a master class. I, I tried to cut this video down to as short as I could, and it was about six minutes, which is still longer than most of the, the video uh, testimonies and things that I do. Um, but there was probably an hour's worth of content that I, I had cut out that all of it was good. And she talks so in depth about what it means to, to be curious about people, to be able to look at people who are hurting and to share the love of Jesus, not, not to, to force it on them, but to, to genuinely see how can you make their life better? How can you come and support them? And she said something, she said that like, it's all of our job. She's like, you don't have to serve on the first impressions team to greet somebody warmly when you notice that you've not seen them before. It's important. It's important that we do that, not because we're trying to boost our numbers and, and get new givers. There's a reason that we don't pass the offering plate every Sunday. We're aware of the baggage that a lot of people have and, and we hope that you will give the way that giving was intended is that you will notice the life-changing power of Jesus and the work of the church and, and you'll want to partner with us when you're ready for that. But you don't have to give your money to have an impact on the kingdom. When you show up and you have open arms, you're not closed off. When you look people in the eye, when you introduce yourself, it can change the trajectory of people's lives because we've seen it time and time again in the gospel. That the way that we embrace the other matters. Hospitality matters because it's how Jesus lived, because it's how the early church operated. So may you always know that there is a seat here in this place, that there is a seat at the table with Jesus for you.